as we enter into the sacred space of listening and receiving, I invite you to join me in this short induction ceremony in order to be fully open, receptive, and aligned with the information that is for your highest good in this conversation today. Begin by closing your eyes and taking a deep breath into the belly. And as you're breathing, bring your awareness into your heart center, making contact with the light in your heart and find your heart light glowing growing and expanding out around your chest. And now bring that light of your heart up through your crown center, through the top of the head, extending up all the way above you into central sun, making contact with the heart energy of central sun and then bring that powerful energy down through the ethers into the crown of your head down through your body and into your heart center expanding and joining with the light in your heart and continuing down to the base of your spine extending down all the way down into the center of the earth, making contact with the heart center of Mother Earth. And now bring that nurturing energy up through the layers of the earth, carrying liquid crystal plasma through roots up into the base of your spine and then spreading into every cell of your body, moving into the heart center, joining with the light from above and joining with the light of your heart, creating a holy trinity of light within you and then spreading out around you, holding space for your highest good your highest awakening and the opening to receive the divine downloads and codements, activations and light codes that are perfect for you at this time. Breathe that in deeply into your belly, allowing yourself to expand in this energy and opening to step in to the container of receiving. Welcome to the Alchemy of Ascension Season 6. We are exploring expanded states of consciousness. I'm your host, Washayla Sananda, and today I have a returning guest, Neil Gore from Portal to Ascension. Welcome, Neil. Hello, Shayla. So good to be here with you. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you back. We have a really fun topic that I know everyone's going to be excited to hear about. But before we begin that, I would love to let you introduce yourself and your work in your own words. Yeah. Sure. So, hey, everybody. My name is Neil. I am the founder of an organization called Portal to Ascension. And um, I'm not going to give too much of the history of how I got there. I'll tell you what I kind of do now. But um, long story short for how I got to this point was I was always curious about, you know, I was just a curious person. But I, one question that really led me to creating Portal to Ascension was the question of what is the root of all religion? And when I started finding, looking into that, the root of all religion, I started finding ancient information that was connecting us to the stars and the star um, beings even took us even further into some sort of ancient understanding of quantum physics, right? And for what, you know, I'd been told being raised and what a lot of people have been told, the whole ET connection wasn't really like something that is in the mainstream. And then the understanding that the ancients had advanced awarenesses of sciences that we're only now rediscovering was also something that wasn't really put out there. So I went deep, deep down into the rabbit hole to all types of facets that it led me to really trying to uh, understand 
um, our ancient past and where we came from. And the ultimate reason for that was to find out who are we, why are we here, why are we on this planet awake and sentient beings, where is all the other life, how come we can't interact with life on this planet in a way that's conscious and communicative with you know all the life that surrounds all the other species. So as that was happening and I was getting deep into this awareness, this was from 2001 to 2008, 2006, I created a Facebook group called 2012 Consciousness, Mind, Evolution, and Presence. The reason why I created it was I was like learning so much information. I wanted to create a place for people to come and share the content. So as I created that, it took off. We got like thousands and thousands of people. I started creating a Portland chapter, New York chapter, like um, California, UK. And um, then by 2008, I had a dream to change the name of the organization to Portal to Ascension. And when I changed the name, I did my first event. It was actually called Hypno Creativity. So it was like a, a event where my friend was doing like binaural beats, different types of frequencies with hypnosis to unlock your creative potential. That led into meditation events, sound healing events, tours up and down the coast in 2010, 2011, extraterrestrial channeling tours, sound healing tours, ancient alien conferences by 2011, 2012. And then it just kept, you know, building up momentum from then until 2015, which is more of a um, kind of like the current platform release started in 2015, which was an online university for consciousness where I decided, let me just, because I quit Portal to Ascension multiple times because like, first of all, it was like a lot of work and there's a lot of missionary work and I wasn't really getting paid for it. I was, I was really, um, I quit my job multiple times to do it. Uh, even though I didn't, you know, didn't have any money to support myself, I was just so passionate that I just quit everything that I had that was generating income to jump right into it. And since I did that, I got to a point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't travel, pay for the gas, pay for venues. So in 2015, I stopped all live events, went 100% online, created the first Starseed Summit, Portal to Ascension Starseed Summit, uh, with Dolores Cannon as the headliner speaker. And then that event did so well that I quit my job two days later and began doing the online university. Since then, we have now do around 110 events a year. We're back to live events as well. So around 80% of them, like 80 to 90 events are online. Conferences, retreats, online retreats, webinars, you know, all types of different things. And then 20% of them are live. And last couple of years, we weren't doing live events. So now we're going back to live events. And so what Portal to Ascension is, I say is a one-stop shop for consciousness. It's a place for us to go and not only to get become the teachers of this new paradigm, like you're going there to fine-tune your skills, learn more information, um, expand your consciousness so you can be the teacher you're meant to be. Or it's for someone who's just waking up and saying like, whoa, what's going on? I wish there was a centralized place I can go to to really hold my hand as I awaken. So that's Portal to Ascension too. Uh, at this point, we've created over 10,000 hours of content, new websites being launched, and I'm here in Mount Shasta with two of my really good friends, literally here to just like really just do deep dive for three months into all the productions that we're creating. Yes, awesome. And I mean, Portal to Ascension on YouTube, there is just such a vast wealth of information there. It just goes on and on and on. So anybody that's mm -hmm. interested, you can check that out, tune in and, and see all the great stuff that Neil's done over the years. And I'm so glad that you found your way to be able to support yourself through doing that work because, you know, something that people don't realize um, is that when we do something like a summit or a YouTube channel or events, it's, you know, it's the, the producer is putting everything in and sometimes not getting any um, financial gain out of it. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it is a little challenge sometimes to figure that piece out. And most people that do this work, spiritual work are not independently wealthy. So there are those, those basic needs that have to get met. Right, and exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'm glad that you got that figured out and that you're able to do it because you bring so many amazing people to the forefront and let people have a platform to talk. And then of course, let people learn from such a diverse array of people. 
-hmm. So, yeah. So I would love to jump into your topic of the day. And I'm really excited about this. I personally, I have memories from what we think of as mm -hmm. ancient Egypt, um, lifetimes there in different bodies. And you have done a lot of research on um, the dating and the consciousness and the tools of what we think of as ancient Egypt. Um, and I'd love for you to get in into that and just start to share. And if questions come up, I'll, I'll ask you. Yeah. And the questions that we have there or the prompts will probably be good along the line for me to, to funnel yes. what I want to share, you know? Yeah. But let's start with this. The Egypt's name was not originally Egypt. It was Kemet or Kem. And what it translates to is land of the black soil, right? And um, the name changed fairly recently in history because Egypt goes back thousands of years. It, Egypt had already had like multiple histories before the name changed. The name changed when Alexander the Great's people went into Egypt, even though they already had connection to it, um, to Egypt for some time, the Greeks, but it was around 300 something BC, the name changed to Egypt. And the way that happened was that the, um, the Egyptians, I mean, the Greeks went to Memphis and when the Egyptians told them what the name of Memphis was, it didn't sound anything like this, but the Greeks thought they heard Egyptos. So they named the whole of the country based on what they thought the name for Memphis was, which still was an incorrect name. And um, so the whole concept of the land of the black soil is multifaceted, because if you look it up online, you'll find that every scholar basically says that the land of the black soil is because the soil of the Egypt, the, the sand was black in certain areas in Egypt. But then if you go dig it a little deeper, you'll see that the original Egyptians were actually black Africans. So um, it's almost like whitewashed. You can't even really find the real truth of why the land was Kem called Kemet. So everyone, like you cannot find anywhere really that doesn't say that it was just because of the soil. But my theory is it was because of the black people, the land of the black soil, land of the black people. And even the this face on the Sphinx, you know, the face changed twice. One before it was the face of a black man. And before that it was the face of a lion, right? So it, it changed over time. So I like to preface it with that because the whole um, concept of Egypt, um, there's this whole movement to really bring back comedic philosophy. And comedic philosophy is the original philosophy that, you know, probably came out of Atlantis. And then also there's Kemetic yoga, which is the one of the original forms of yoga that also came out of Egypt, Kemet, Kemetic yoga. And in Kemetic yoga, they're actually doing moves like the Sphinx pose, things like that. It's almost like hieroglyphic moves, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a good way to kind of just bring it in just to kind of have the understanding of the name changes because Egypt is much more ancient than we've been told, right? And you can stop me at any point, ask for clarification, um, because I'll just keep going, you know. Yeah, I so I do have I do have one thing I want to ask you yeah, about. Yeah. Um, I've read information, uh, some research that points to the Sphinx originally being Anubis. Have you heard of that? I have heard of that. So, um, from what I've researched, has been people that have talked about the face being, you know, the face of a lion. I haven't gone into Anubis and all that, so. Yeah, that's quite a possibility as well. But ultimately, the the real thing uh, when it comes to the Sphinx is the true dating of the Sphinx and, you know, and who created it in the first place. Because it looks like that Egypt could have actually, the Egyptians that we know in um, dynastic Egypt may actually be a tribe that came to Egypt after the original Egyptians. That it could have been an original race of people there that eventually changed over time or multiple times. And like we see in a lot of ancient cultures, is that we see um, individuals coming in and moving into an area and claiming it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And and oftentimes destroying some of what was there before and you know writing hieroglyphs on top of it. We found that in Egypt as well. A lot of places, there's hieroglyphs. And if you take the stone of the hieroglyph off the wall or it falls off, which is usually what happens, there's a whole bunch of hieroglyphs behind it of some ancient civilization, right? So let's talk specifically about the Sphinx first. The dating of the Sphinx has conventionally been given to around 3000 something BC. And the reason for that is that um, we see some hieroglyphs that talk about the creation of the Sphinx 
But then we have all these, you know, researchers such as Robert Schock and um, John Anthony West. But Robert Schock, he he actually is the geologist that really, I would say, is probably responsible for the real dating of the Sphinx. Uh, he did. He's going to be speaking at our upcoming conference in April, but he spoke at our Port Extension Conference in Irvine in 2018. And he did all these geological studies around the Sphinx for weather, uh, for um, erosion from the water. So multiple things um, dated this back to a different date. So the weathering around the Sphinx is at least 11,000 years old, right? Taking us back 11 to 12,000 years old, taking us back to around 11,000 BC, and which coincides with the, the right after the time of 11,900 BC, where there was a worldwide cataclysm and a huge flood that took place on the planet that either happened through influence of solar flares or an asteroid impact. So it seems the Sphinx was probably created soon after this worldwide cataclysm. So the geological studies takes us back uh, to this year, and that's around, what is that? That's around six, seven, 7,000 years earlier than we've been told that the Sphinx is. Well, the issue with that is conventionally accepted that humans were very primitive at that time, that we didn't have the intellect, we didn't have the technology, we didn't have the consciousness to create such a masterpiece. So a lot of people have been facing, you know, really going towards uh, the fact that it can't be that old just because of that concept. Another element is that the Sphinx was actually facing, so we know that the Sphinx, when it was created, was facing the constellation of Leo, right? Which is where the whole concept of had a face of a lion because it was facing the constellation of Leo. And if you go back in the zodiacs, right, the procession of the equinoxes, and you go back that every 2,000 years or so, there's a different zodiac that's the main zodiac in the sky. The last 2,000 years, we've been in Pisces, which is why the fish is a symbol for Jesus, right? As monotheistic as uh, Christianity is, the symbolism is based entirely on astrology. There, um, so when we look at um, the Sphinx, constellation of Leo, the last time the constellation of Leo was directly in front of the Sphinx, 11,000 to 12,000 years ago, which coincides with the geological erosions, right? And just another one, just since we're specifically talking about the dating right now, there's a few other elements. Um, we have an understanding of the position of the Nile River when it was in its heyday utilized in within Egypt based on hieroglyphs and other texts that have been found. And if we do a geological study to see the position of the Nile River to where it moved to now, it used to be on the other side of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau. It moved all the way to the other side. And if we go back to the point where it was supposed to be, that equals the exact same time as the um, erosions around the uh, Sphinx and the constellation of Leo, 11 to 12,000 years ago. So these are just three out of many different um, uh, things that we've been doing that has really dated, you know, Egypt way, way earlier than than we've been told. And the whole understanding is that um, that they were tapped into some sort of awareness that was more ancient. And it seems like Egypt was actually a creation of a civilization that was an answer to the fall of another one, right? And that goes into the whole Atlantis um, concept that is quite possibly, and my hardcore belief is that there was a great civilization in the Atlantic Ocean that it actually um, submerged underwater, but it didn't just submerge underwater overnight. There was a series of cataclysms. It took many, many years, and there was three cataclysms that took place that eventually this entire continent um, was, you know, went under the water and while this was happening, the, the descendants of this great civilization were moving into North Africa. So now we have the Plato, Gates of Gibraltar, Pillars of Hercules, right? The entrance to, to the Atlantic Ocean, the Gates of Gibraltar. You have Gibraltar in Spain, you have Morocco in Africa, right? And so right after that was Atlantis. And then you have Atlantis falling. And where did the uh, people from Atlantis go? They went all over the world, but they went into France, into France area and they inhabited the Basque region. So now you have the Basque people that say they have a connection to an, an island that was in the Atlantic Ocean. They have no genetic similarities to the French people. And then you have the Berbers who are all throughout North Africa because the whole of North Africa was Egypt. It wasn't just Egypt on that side. They had inhabited the whole entire continent. But the thing is that 
what is the number one thing that you find in North Africa that takes up most of the space? The Sahara Desert. What's the least excavated place in the entire world? The Sahara Desert, right? Two reasons. One is um, because of um, ignorance. You know, a lot of people just see it as a barren wasteland and they don't realize that 11,000 years ago, the Sahara Desert was a lush oasis because we we're in the ice age. The north and the south was all full of ice. The center around the equator, around the entire world, the most beautiful avatar-like kingdom, right? So that was one thing. And the second thing is, if we were to start digging in Sahara Desert, we're going to have to quickly start rewriting our history books because we're going to find that great civilizations are completely submerged under the sand there, right? So I'm just going to stop there and we, yeah. you know, yeah, that's yeah, fascinating. And, you know, I've certainly heard that and and believe that it was fertile land when when Egypt was thriving, when the ancient yeah. culture there was thriving. And that also points to the um, the black soil that's fertile ground, a place that's lush and an oasis and um, a place where things grow well. Um, mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I definitely want to start to move into the consciousness of the ancient Egyptians. We have all of these hieroglyphs. We have, you know, all different types of um, beings in the pictographs. And, you know, we've got, of course, Anubis and um, Isis, Osiris, there are the Hathors and, you know, so many different types of beings. In, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, are these actual gods? Are they mythological? Are they um, are they actual beings that were there at that time giving knowledge? And, you know, where did this, they seem to have great consciousness of healing and sound and lots of different modalities that we're only just beginning to understand today. Um, so what do you think about what was really going on there and how did they get this amazing awareness? Mm, yeah. So you said a few things here and it would be nice if we can uh, go through all of them, but you basically um, alluded to the fact that there are multiple beings represented in, in Egypt, right? So we'll talk about like how it could have been a hub for ET life or connection to them. Um, and the cycles that it is like, the consciousness level of them and also the sound and frequency because the whole sound and frequency thing is its own entire segment really to dive in to the incredible awareness that these ancients had and um, what i'm excited to talk about we'll talk about in a little bit here is the architecture and what i'll just say this real quick every element of egypt even probably where the a toilet seat was placed just to be like playing around a little bit was literally put in the perfect position in order for us to realize a map of how to recreate civilization it's like the most intentional civilization that ever existed the position from a signpost to the position of a pyramid a temple the position from a pyramid to another pyramid the positioning of all the pyramids and the sizes of them on the giza plateau not just aligned to constellation of um Orion, and since I already spoke about it, I might as well get into it right now first, and then we'll get the other ones. So I was always into Egypt because obviously, like spirituality, consciousness, ancient history, I was into it. But I wasn't like adamant about going to Egypt because of how commercialized it is, and um, and it just didn't really appeal to me until I went on a deep dive two years ago uh, for my Pythagoras presentation, which is probably my most favorite presentation I ever did. And when I started doing this, I realized I was dedicating a quarter of the presentation to Egypt because I found all this information of where Pythagoras got his content from. And we'll talk about the mystery schools in a bit and talk about Sheshat, which is a really, um, um, I guess, forgotten deity. Hardly anybody knows about her. And he was initiated into her mystery school before the mystery school of Thebes, before the mystery school of Thoth. And that's where a lot of the information came from. But when I was doing this, I realized that, you know, as I just said earlier, that everything in Egypt was perfectly positioned in order for us to recreate civilization. And it seems like something happened where there was a destruction on the planet and then Egypt was created and they mapped it out in a way that they made sure that if humanity got wiped again, had to restart again, that they could come to Egypt and figure out everything, what the tilt of the axis of the earth is, how fast it rotates, what the circumference of the earth is, 
um, how to rebuild structures, the Pythagorean theorem embedded in rocks, the flower of life being in one temple where there is no other hieroglyphs except for one hieroglyph in this huge temple, and it's the flower of life, right? So all these, and even the positioning of the, the staff of Thoth on a hieroglyph, and let's start with that one. The positioning, if you look at the positioning of the Staff of Thoth on the hieroglyphs, it shows you two things. One, it's the exact angle of the tilt of the earth every time. And then two, the tilt of the earth is the opposite side, as if there was a pole shift and the tilt shifted onto the other side, right? And so just like that level of detail is just incredible, right? So... Um, what were some other elements I wanted to share about that? Okay, yes, the Pythagorean theorem. So when I was looking for Pyth uh, Pyth Pythagoras information, I realized, they were, did you want to say something? No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so when I looked at Pythagoras, um, like where he got his info from, there was a few things that I came across, um, many things. But the, when it came to the Pythagorean theorem, you know, a lot of people, they, they kind of hate on Pythagoras because they it's pretty much known that he didn't really come up with all this information himself. It is um, documented that he took psychedelics and he was practicing with sound frequencies to reach levels of consciousness that was getting him to this um, awareness as well. So he did piece things together. But um, one thing that is, you know, given him credit for and is a Pythagorean theorem. So a disclaimer is you can't, hate on Pythagoras because he never called it the Pythagorean theorem people after that did right so he when he was born he moved around all of um Europe and the Middle East because his dad was a merchant and his dad would take him to all these civilizations and he actually lived in Babylon before like um he was initiated into Babylonian mystery schools and he got this tablet there where it was basically um, the Pythagorean theorem written out, like the theorem of this whole thing. So he he got the tablet from that. And then before, this is even before he even moved to Greece, before he lived in Greece, he was all over the place. He was initiated into Zoroastrianism. And then he made his way to Egypt, where he was there for 20 something years. He was initiated to all these mystery schools. So here we go. The positioning of the Giza Plateau. Pyramid, 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 right? Orion's belt. Get all of those pyramids, Put them right next to each other, right? In between the pyramids, the Pythagorean triangle. Hmm. Each of the sides of the pyramid represents A squared plus B squared equals C squared. The small one, A squared, next one, B squared, next one, C squared, the sides of the pyramid. Put them together, the Pythagorean theorem. The theorem that literally we utilize to create all structures and rebuild society, bridges, houses, you know? It's all over. So... He um, basically went and learned all this information from Egypt. That's probably one of the biggest ones. And there's a video on my website, portascension.org, under my Pythagoras presentation, where I show the video of all these pieces coming together and how it makes these equations. And it's really mind-blowing, firstly, that you know they gave this um, information to Pythagoras when regular Egyptians weren't allowed to be initiated into it. And then secondly... That just goes to my whole point that, you know, the whole of Egypt was really created in order for us to really know how to restructure civilization. But they did it in such a beautiful way. They used, now this goes into the acoustics and sound, they use linear math, geometry, quantum physics, equations, and then they combined it with the nonlinear, which is the secular nature of sound, frequency, and creativity. So we have the linear element, they had such a perfect balance of masculine and feminine energy, it seemed. The linear element, not one, not one is better than the other. It's just a different way to explain the source, the oneness. We have linearity. It's just a different way to explain unity consciousness. We do that through mathematics. We have, um, we have the feminine energy of creativity, the circle energy. That's sound, music, you know, um, love, all those things. It's a different way to explain it. So if you go into some of these structures... There's multiple structures in Egypt that are literally known as sound chambers. Uh, the king's chamber in Egypt. The king's chamber, if you go in there and you play certain sounds, it creates this harmony and that bounces back to you. In the Red Pyramid in Egypt, and this is also on the internet, it's on my um, Ancient Civilization Sound and Vibration presentation, that's also on my YouTube.com slash Portal to Ascension, is that 
Um, so Brian Forrester, a guy that I used to work with, he went into the Red Pyramid with a group of people. They all started chanting in the chamber, right? And then no matter what sound that they came up with, the, the, the sound of the pyramid would bounce back A equals 432 hertz. So no matter what vibration came in there, it was creating that sound resonance back. It was changing the frequency it was getting and emanating A, which represents the third eye, which represents the pineal gland, which is the literal depiction of the eye of Horus and the eye of Osiris, which is the intersection cut out of what our pineal gland looks like and a pituitary gland, you know? So they had this great understanding of sound that even goes beyond just hearing the vibration. When wind goes through these structures, the wind still triggers those frequencies to be playing at an inaudible level. So whether the sound is audible or not, the structure is designed in a way to always emanate um, the frequency. And, you know, that goes into a whole other, un other understanding of what were the pyramids, you know? And that's something maybe we'll get into in a moment, but I want to take a moment here because you asked about the beings. So I'll give it back to you for a second if you want to say or add anything, and then we'll go into some beings. Yeah, I, I love this information and just the idea that, you know, everything's in such precision and the idea that they, and I know this about the pyramids that they were sound healing chambers and, and mm -hmm. activation stations sort of, you know, where, where people are getting these frequency downloads and it's helping them ascend. And I love that concept too, of, of just the, the frequencies bouncing around, activating the pineal, the third eye. And yes, I know that's in a lot of the, the, hieroglyphs around the, you know, the cross section of the brain equals the same shape and the same, um, image as the eye of Horus, the eye of Ra. Mm -hmm. Um, so fascinating. I just, yeah, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> right. Like how beautiful is it? Like, honestly, like right now my heart is like expanding and I'm just like in euphoria, just thinking about it. Like how beautiful is it that they, the eye of Horus and Osiris, that is the perfect representation of a masculine and feminine balance of energy. You're showing the scientific understanding of the inner workings of the human consciousness. And at the same time, you're drawing a beautiful piece of art that represents your mystery schools, which is the school in order for you to get into to understand this awareness, right? Like just the, just the beauty of it all. So we're going to actually take 20 people to Egypt in September of next year. So if you want to go, Nice. We're going to be chanting some of these pyramids, you know, it's mm. going to be next level. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Write right. That so, down. <laughs> and so it's going to be Alan, myself, Joan, or we're, we're taking and the Stargate people. So it's going to be really cool. Ooh, fun. All right. So the, um, where were we? We're talking about sound and frequency. So it's a good, it's really a good connection to what would they use for? Uh, but firstly, the connection to ET. So now you asked the question, do I think, that their ETs were here interacting with us? Do I think these are mythological beings? No, I think um, some stories over time became more uh, fantastical and some stories were maybe created as we devolved in consciousness, but I feel the original source of these gods and these beings were actual entities and star beings that interacted with our consciousness and or our planet at some point, right? And now, I think the jury is still out there when it comes to me because I'm not a channeler, so I'm not just like, yes, this happened. Um, either they, these beings were visitors many, like thousands of years ago in our past, and the Egyptians reached a level of consciousness where they had the technology, inner and external technology, to be able to communicate with these beings and understand them. Or, um, so there's three elements here. So ancient past, really ancient past, seeding of the earth, these beings were here, then then all of a sudden the Egyptians were able to connect with them. Another one is Atlantis was communicating with them, and then all the information that came out of Atlantis was then sent out to Egypt, and then it started being represented and shown there, and they could have still connected with them too. And then the third one is that they actually were visiting us that long ago, which was pretty soon, pretty recent, right? The reason why I'm thinking maybe not around that time is because even though there were cataclysms in the world, there weren't any major cataclysms that were world resetting after 13,000 years ago. So if this civilization was created and the beings were visiting, 
I would think that we would also be finding more evidence of these beings actually being on the earth. Whereas before 13,000 years ago, there was a cataclysm that could have wiped out a lot of that evidence, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but I do feel that they were connecting to them. So now this goes into what were the pyramids used for? Just like everything else that they did, it was multifaceted. The chambers were sound frequency places that could probably do two things, help assist with ailments, emotional, psychological, physical ailments, but also get them to a level of consciousness where they were able to go into a meditative state and have open communication and download from these beings. So that's one thing. Um, sound chambers, so we talked about that. Power plants, right? And so these, these structures were built at a time, and this goes into the ages, the golden age and all that. So I'm going to make a note here because I want to talk about that. So the pyramids of Egypt weren't the only ones created around that time or even right around before it, like a few thousand years before. There was a worldwide pyramid culture. There's pyramids in China and in India. There were pyramids all over the um, the North, North America. Many of them were destroyed. In South America, we still see them, right? And um, so there was a worldwide pyramid culture at some point that could have happened multiple times in our evolution and devolution cycles. So as these worldwide pyramid culture was going on, it seems a lot of these pyramids were built on ley lines of Earth, the ley lines, the energy flow of Earth. And this doesn't exclude the pyramids in Egypt, uh, on the Giza Plateau. They were also created on ley lines. And now you can go to Stonehenge, you can go to stone circles in South Africa, you can go all over the world. And you're seeing a lot of these ancient prehistory sites, megalithic sites mostly, are built on energy centers as if these ancients knew how the energy flowed on Earth. And that they were utilizing the energy, the frequency, because the earth emanates a frequency, it's an electromagnetic being just like you and me. It's made out of sub subatomic particles just like you and me. Subatomic particles vibrate, create an electromagnetic field, equals the aura. So as they um, the earth vibrates, there's certain areas on the earth that the frequency is a little different. And these ley lines are those areas. So they built it there to tap into the collective frequency of the earth and these structures were built as an amplifying device to amplify that frequency. Case in point would be the stone circles in South Africa that have literally been proven scientifically to take the natural resonance of the earth and amplify it into the hundreds of gigahertz level, right? Which is unheard of and not able to be done by any natural application on earth. Not able to be done for any natural application. This is the only place on earth this is happening. So the, it's amplifying the energy. Now, the question is, why was it doing that? Why did they need to do that? This gets into the yuga cycles and the cycles of time. The 26,000 year cycle that we go through of the evolution, devolution of consciousness, plus or minus a few hundred years, could be, um, well, is, a could have actually been going on for millennia. We don't know how long this 26,000 year cycle has been going on. But one thing is um, for sure in my book is that this cycle represents evolution of consciousness and a devolution of consciousness. When I first woke up, I used to think like, where's all the technology if these beings were so much more advanced, right? And then in my recent years, because I just um, got a degree in Yuga cycles. So I've been like doing um, deep dive classes and certifications on Yuga cycle teaching. And um, as I started understanding this, I realized well, you cannot put technology with consciousness evolution. And evolution in consciousness doesn't always represent an evolution in external technology. Because when you evolve your consciousness, you get to a conscious level that you don't even need a lot of these external things in order to please yourself. You're at peace with what you have. So a lot of stonewall art represents beings at a high level of consciousness, but they're not there writing notes on, the, on their computers um, and the putting the computers in uh, some sort of container, hoping we'd find it later. They're just being with the planet and then showing their art in whatever tools they have around us. So I, I disconnected technology advancement from consciousness. This is not to say that there weren't consciousness evolved communities that had advanced technology, like traveling through space, that probably did exist. But to understand that we don't have to look for computer chips in ancient Egypt to realize that they were advanced, okay? So... The, now we go 11,000, 12,000 years ago. If you look at the cycles of time, 26,000 years, we just came out of the Kali Yuga. There's two different types of dark ages, Kali Yuga 
um, calendars. One says the Kali Yuga ends around 1900 something. The other one says it ended in 1700. And there's a 200 year transitory phase from one cycle to the next. So we fully emerged in the Dwarpa Yuga, which is the Bronze Age in 1900. Every age has its own theme. The Kali Yuga has the uh, authority and hierarchy and delusion. That's the Kali Yuga, right? And we don't even need to go into that. Authority, hierarchy, delusion pretty much sums up where we've been. And the Dwarpa Yuga is the age of energy, right? So like basically we're, um, we found electricity. We found quantum physics. We found out we are energy. We end up mastering our own energy fields. And that's what happens by the end of this age. By the end of this age, we become the masters of energy. It starts with external electricity. It ends with, well, we are a, a battery. How do we activate that, right? Yeah. So now go back to the Sphinx and the fall of Atlantis. The fall of Atlantis happened at the Younger Dryas period, at the end of the last ice age. It coincides with a cataclysm that ended the ice age in such a rapid phase. We we're at a level of really high consciousness during that time. So it's interesting that a cataclysm occurred right at the top of the yuga cycle because the Satya Yuga, so we have all the yuga cycles on one side, we have all the yuga cycles on the other side. They double, they reflect, right? So the Kali Yuga is at the bottom, two of them join. The Satya Yuga, two of them join. Each yuga cycle is twice as large as the last one. Thank God the Kali Yuga is the shortest. So the Kali Yuga is short, and then the Dwarpa Yuga is twice as long, the uh, Tretha Yuga is twice as long, the Satya Yuga, the Golden Age, is twice as long. So we have two, like, four times as long as the Kali Yuga Age is back-to-back, so the Golden Age is the longest time. And then we were at the top of the end of one Golden Age and starting the descending Golden Age. Still in the Golden Age, but it's starting to descend into the Lower Ages, right when the Cataclysm occurred. Now go back 100,000 years in conventional um, archaeology, um, conventional um, physics, and we will see that almost every 13,000 or 26,000 years, there's some sort of Cataclysm that does that, and it always coincides with the end of an age, right? So now when they were falling, so this goes into now why the pyramids were created. The pyramids seem to have been, we were at a level of consciousness where we didn't need external tools to keep our consciousness high. What was happening on the planet is was there was a deception going on. Atlantis had just fell. Egypt and other great civilizations were coming up. And a lot of these mystery schools and awareness were being embedded into these places. We started seeing exclusivity at this point, where they started saying that this information is sacred. It needs to be hidden. Not everybody can learn all this information. It needs to be hidden until we're ready to reascend and know this information. So we, that's why we got the, all the mystery schools in Egypt that were literally holding it. They were caretakers of this information. The pyramids were created as a tool to harness the natural energy of the earth to create a grid around the planet to keep the level of consciousness at, at, at a point where we didn't have to devolve more. It's, it was almost like a fight a, like the people that were aware of the cycles of time at that moment were almost like fighting to not lose that level of consciousness. They were trying to see if they didn't, they could keep the earth at a certain level. But then we see at pyramids all over the world around 6,000 BC, burn marks, explosion marks in the red pyramid in, in Mexico, in other pyramids in Egypt. And it seems like these pyramids overheated or overpowered and exploded at a certain level, 6,000 BC, which happens to be at the beginning of another yuga cycle, right? And that's a whole, like, I just gave you that one piece of information there. That's a whole other rabbit hole of research to really see that there seems to be these um, burn marks that look like these pyramids overpowered. So, yeah, um, yeah so basically, we went down to the cycle where they're at a level, a very high level of consciousness. And then ultimately, they started building other tools. They built the Ankh. The Ankh wasn't there. Um, back when they were at their pinnacle at their like at the peak the ankh was another tool as they were devolving in consciousness they started needing to create external tools to give them what they were able to do at one point internally you know we see we see that throughout egypt so yeah 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 interesting and that makes perfect sense to me and you know my experience as 
I, I'm somewhat of a channel, you know, I don't really identify as a channel, but I do tune into higher dimensional experiences. What I've experienced is that all of those beings, um, Isis, Toth, Osiris, Anubis, I've all com had communications with all of them. They are still present. They're just on a slightly higher frequency than mm. most humans are. And so we can contact them by raising our frequency and by having that intention. And also when I think of, um, you know, the, the life in Egypt in its prime, it's a higher dimension of reality. Mm. So that's that probably yes. that higher goal golden age where things were just in a higher frequency all the way around. And so yes, tech, the, the physical technologies aren't necessary. Everything is an organic technology. And then as we devolve or um, lose, you know, our level of frequency and consciousness, that's when we need more mm -hmm. support from, you know, physical items that can help expand energy. So fascinating. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And just to add to that, like the, uh, like I would love to one day actually do a presentation called fall from grace. And it's almost like it's the, the biblical story of the angels falling, right. And humans falling to earth, but we see it throughout almost every ancient culture. It's like the story repeated in the Babylonian text. We see the fallen angels or the sons of God coming down from, you know, the um, Nibiru onto earth, which was actually the same exact story as the biblical one of the fallen angels. Right. But then in Egypt, uh, we see the tilt of the earth being shifted from, it seems like in Atlantis that the earth's axis was probably was not the same as it is now, but quite possibly a straight axis. So, which is why Egypt, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs all over, they really, really concentrate on showing you the tilt of the axis of earth. Multi I showed you one place, yeah. multiple places in different ways. Even the um, the slope on certain pyramids are the tilt of the axis mm -hmm. of the earth. So almost to show you that something happened to earth. And then there was a fall from grace that occurred soon after Egypt was created, within thousands of years after, as we we're coming down, which was literally the representation of us falling from the understanding and the connection to the source yeah. to being in this world of amnesia. Yes. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, Neil, we are getting toward the end of our time together. Time flies when you're in interesting conversations. Right. Um, I want to make sure we tell people about what you're offering. So you have a free yeah. gift, which is the Inca Healing Practices webinar. Can you tell us yes. about that? Yeah. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say. It oh, takes two minutes because say it. Okay, no worries. It's um, just because I think this is really important because this shows how um, Egypt was a matriarchal society and they went into patriarchy. And there's a deity that no one really uh, knows or remembers. And her name is Sheshat. Sheshat. And um, she was actually How's it spelled? Thoth's counterpart. S-E-S-H-A-T. Okay. Sheshat. Right? So... Um, you find very little information on her, but I went through nine months of research just to find everything I could about her. And she was Thoth's counterpart. Um, six, in pre-dynastic Egypt, conventionally accepted, 6,000 BC and beyond, she was actually worshipped. And then um, and Thoth was worshipped with her. And then all of a sudden, we see her being taken from the history books, and then we see only Thoth. She was actually the creator of the Emerald Tablets. And she's the one that um, she was the... Uh, creator of architecture, weights and measures, sound and frequency, astronomy, uh, writing. She, she created all those disciplines. Now, she was either an Atlantean like Thoth, or I think Thoth and um, Seshat were actually non-humans that lived in Atlantean, Atlantis. But um, it's actually, and this isn't, I'm not just making up. This is like, if you look at the ancient scriptures, you will find this. And she basically taught Thoth on how to teach everything she created to humanity. So you can't even blame Thoth for taking credit. Humans did that for him. So basically, she created all these disciplines that we now use to do everything in this world. She taught Thoth how to teach humanity, how to be the teacher of this information. And then Thoth came down and taught us all this stuff. And then we became patriarchal and Shashat got completely forgotten and it became the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. It became everybody's channeling Thoth and Hermes. But even with that, so I have a lot of skepticism within me because when people 
channel Thoth without the understanding of where he even got this information from. I kind of can see that it's almost like um, giving him exclusive credit as if he is the founder of all this, when really it was kind of a divine masculine and feminine interaction that really assisted us in creating all these disciplines. So I just want to mention that because I feel it's, it's just like knowing Kemet was the original name. I think knowing about Sheshat really takes you to the antiquity of Egypt. Yeah, thank you for presencing that. And it is time to yeah. bring the the balance back with the feminine and yeah. allow the masculine feminine balance to be restored. Yes, thank you. Yes, definitely. Well, Neil, this has been so insightful. Thank you for everything that you shared today, all of your research and everything that you provide through Portal to Ascension. I appreciate you so much and I'm so grateful to have you back. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Oshela. I feel the same way about you. I really appreciate you, your energy, everything you are. So thank you for having me. Mm, my pleasure. Have a wonderful day or evening wherever you are. Namaste.